everybody and you're watching Mapping Fault Lines. On the 10th of March, Iran and Saudi Arabia resumed their diplomatic relations after a long hiatus. It is China which arranged this deal between them, not the United States, and it has been welcomed all over the world. Today, we have two special guests with us. We have Ambassador, former Ambassador of India to Turkey and Uzbekistan, Mr. M.K. Bhadrakumar, and we have Prabhi Purkaisa, the Editor-in-Chief of NewsClick. Welcome to the show. Ambassador Bhadrakumar, can I begin with you first? Um, mm. You know, one of the things the media is saying, it's a surprise deal, it is a deal, it's a shocker, and some of the media is also using the term secret arrangement. But can you walk us through the momentum that this announcement had behind it? You see, the fact of the matter is that uh, <clears throat> in Middle East, in the bazaar, nothing remains a secret for long. Uh, but in this particular case, this has been a noble exception that the Chinese were mediating and uh, that they were, in fact, before the announcement was made in Beijing, there were five days of intensive negotiations. Right. Uh, even on, they got into even details, apparently, you know, from what I have gathered from Middle East publications, uh, uh, the Saudi and Iranian thing. And the Chinese, uh, you know, stepping in to, you know, iron out any kind of, uh, if any hiccup scheme, that kind of thing. So these five days where actual negotiations took place. So this is not something that, you know, that they were uh, arranging a photo opportunity. It's not that. It's a, it's a really real-time Chinese mediation. So the factors there are, you know, the, uh, the suddenness of it is because including the Americans, Americans put on a brave face later right. to say that they have been kept informed. Of course, we all were kept informed that the Iranians and the uh, Saudis were talking in Baghdad with uh, Oman's mediation and so on. Everyone knew. But <clears throat> uh, the Americans were very evasive about it. Did they know about the Chinese mediation? The answer is no. And the, and the clearest indication that there has been a kind of a you can only call it deception, was that on that morning in the Wall Street Journal, mm -hmm. there was a very, an exclusive report saying that the United States and the Saudi Arabia were at the threshold of striking a deal. Okay. And that the Saudi uh, demand was that uh, Saudi should have access to enrichment technology. And the Americans were pondering over it because the Biden administration is not very sure whether this would clear in the Congress, where Saudi Arabia is a toxic subject. <clears throat> so, you know, the thing is, they were really barking up the wrong tree. And that morning, you know, it was a sensational story. I read that Wall Street Journal thing. Then comes in the afternoon, the announcement from Beijing that <clears throat> this deal has been. And now that deal between the United States and Saudi Arabia is actually to see that Saudi Arabia according to Wall Street Journal. So it's fake news, as it turned out, right. uh, that uh, the uh, Saudis would join the Abraham Accords. Saudis and, Ira and Israelis and all, this, uh, all these other guys there together will form a united front against uh, uh, Iran. Uh, in other words, uh, this is a, a run-up to a action against Iran. You know, uh, they, 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 they are creating a diplomatic track to gather momentum for putting pressure on Iran's nuclear program. You know, the, that, of course, I don't want to get into now. But <clears throat> the point is, therefore, I'm making is here that uh, even as of that morning, nobody had any clue. Frankly, of course, we had no clue. And when the news broke in the afternoon, Wall Street Journal had to scramble to come up with an analysis of what happened. Right. So, you see, this is, the, this is the reality, cold reality, you know. In fact, I, I wrote on the Twitter that, you know, the, the two stories of Wall Street Journal on the same day, diametrically opposite. To each other. So, you know, the, uh, the Chinese negotiated, you know, this deal. Uh, it's not that uh, they, they, they provided Beijing as a setting for it. Uh, the other parties, both sides, obviously, Saudis and the Iranians, uh, given the depth of their rivalry and the <clears throat> extended period over time 
where all these negative passions were playing out and they both hit each other quite a bit. Uh, <clears throat> burying a hatchet, of, it's not a small hatchet like that, you know, it's not an easy thing. Absolutely. So the fact that, you know, that they trusted the Chinese is another factor. That they trusted the Chinese, both sides, and uh, that gives a completely different coloring to it. This is what has shocked the Americans. That, you know, that nobody thought that the Chinese had such soft power in West Asia. And now, you know, they are actually towering so far, um, so much higher than the Americans. Right. In, in terms of their stature there. So, you see, these are, I'm just assembling here the pieces, you know, different uh, angles to this. Then there is a geopolitical background to it, that the <coughs> security environment, the geopolitical environment, all were conducive for a uh, for a reconciliation because uh, you have to trace it to a process which has been underway in uh, west asia uh, for the last uh, two to three years clearly which is this that uh, <coughs> these countries started diversifying their foreign external relations and they, they, they structured a, a, a thing called Look East. Right. And moving, that is basically gravitating away from... Uh, uh, now, this is not only in reaction to the flawed policies pursued by the United States. This is also a result of a new thinking. A new thinking where uh, they were preparing themselves for an era of multipolarity because you see the other uh, symptoms there they are seeking membership of uh, Shanghai cooperation organization right of BRICS and the Saudis have a have even brought about a proximity between um, OPEC and Russia you know so OPEC plus right so you see uh, <laughs> If you look at all these things that were happening, this is the culmination of a process which was gathering momentum because its time has come in modern history. Yeah, Prabir, so what are the factors? The media is constantly <coughs> saying that the US is stepping away and China is stepping in. But it's not that simple, is it? There was a growing mistrust of US policies, its interventionism in West Asia. What are the recent causes which we, you can trace to uh, this look to the East policy? Well, I think there are proximate causes, immediate causes, and there are a larger set of causes. And I think uh, Ambassador Bhadra Kumar has talked about the larger causes as well. And I would say in that the fact that today China is the major trade partner for 80% of the world. Right. Only about 20 years back. The United States was the major trade partner of 80% of the world, probably 70% of the world and 70% of the world to the China, but 70 to 80% roughly. So given that, the issue is how do you set your external policy? It's also to do with your economic policy. So if today China is a market as well as a supplier of developed technologies and goods, so given that there is a stake in the Chinese market, which is not there in the US market today for even a country like Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia doesn't export any oil to the United States. The United right. States is, in hydrocarbon terms, self-sufficient. So there is this larger geopolitical shift. Why Saudi Arabia thinks it's in, in, interesting to join BRICS or Shanghai cooperation. Uh, the fact that Russia, Saudi Arabia put together now are big oil producers and they have a, they have for certain common interests right. which they don't share with the United States anymore. When the United States was a big importer of oil, OPEC had a different relationship with the United States. So all of this is, as I said, the, some of the larger shifts that have taken place. And today, as you know, even in terms of science and technology, even according to the US strategic partners, Japan science uh, institution was there. Now recently, the Australian strategic tracker, as it's called, have said right. China is leading in much many more areas of science and technology than the US is. This was pointed out by the Japanese institutions earlier. Now, that is the larger framing of it. The much narrower framing of it, let's not forget that both Iran 
as well as other countries in Hezbollah, for instance, in uh, uh, in that part of the world vis-a-vis -vis Israel has shown the power of uh, what I will call asymmetric warfare. You don't have to be a big military power to be able to defend yourself, not to attack, subjugate others, but to defend yourself. Mm -hmm. Because if, for instance, Iran, when Soleimani was assassinated, you can see the reaction that Iran had and actually the, the U.S. fleet left the shores of Iran to go far away because they were afraid they could be hit and their bases were hit physically in, in that part of the world. Also, the whole issue about what in Yemen, Saudis have been given American arms and also American, what would be called the Patriot batteries, which right. supposedly, supposedly bring down missiles. Well, the missile that was launched on the airport, which they claimed was brought down by a Patriot battery, Saudis knew very well the battery didn't hit it. In fact, if the warhead separates from the body near the airport and that body falls down to the ground and they claim that was a Patriot hit, but the warhead had actually hit the airport. And this is not what I'm saying. It's really... Uh, People in the United States have done the analysis, showed the pictures, showed the photographs, and they said, well, Patriot wasn't very successful. And Saudis promptly returned the Patriot batteries. So given that, Yemen is bleeding Saudi Arabia. Let's be clear. Right. Then they thought with the amount of weapons they had got from the West, it will be a walkover. These are really people who can't fight. And now Houthis have not only hit them, yes, yes. Yeah, Iran has shared technology with the Houthis, but the asymmetric war makes it possible for Aramco to be hit. And if that happens, and what happens to Saudi Arabian oil industries, so therefore the need to finish the Yemen war, reach some settlement, I think is also one of the reasons that this agreement is taking place. Let's not forget, as uh, Ambassador Bhadra Kumar said, this has been in the making for the last two years. And Suleimani's assassination, General Suleimani's assassination, is supposed to be a part of that because he was coming to Iraq. And Iraq, as you know, as he has said, also with Oman, were the people who were sort of playing the backroom uh, work to bring these people together. But as everybody uh, who's in the know says, yes, we knew about this, but the China could play this major role. That's right. taken everybody by surprise. Ambassador Patrukmar, do you think there is a greater chance of some sort of longer lasting peace in Yemen because of the role China has played and will probably continue to play in the region now? Well, I'm sure about it because, you know, after this uh, announcement was made in Beijing, there was a, uh, there was a, uh, there was a interview mm -hmm. given by the uh, Saudi prince, who's a foreign minister. Right. Now, uh, he, uh, you know, there are many, many things, you know, which are to be connected, many dots, you know. One is uh, the day before this announcement was made in uh, Beijing, the Saudi foreign minister landed suddenly in Moscow. Okay. And uh, I saw the television images. Lavrov was delighted. And one could suspect that, you know, I mean, what brought the Saudi foreign minister to Moscow? It was a huge signal to the Americans. Nobody went from Riyadh to Washington. But he was there and they took the Russians into confidence, naturally. The Russians, in other words, put it differently. Russians are part of it. You know, the, the, this process which was going on. And the, uh, the fact is that, you know, that on the diplomatic front, there is very intense coordination between Beijing and Moscow these days Okay. on uh, most all major issues and most minor issues. They work very closely together already. That sort of a, a synchronization is there already, coordination. So this is a very momentous happening and Russians and America, uh, Russians and Chinese were together in this because that was also evident from the warm words of welcome that Lavrov extended to the prince. The opening remarks, which are open for cameras, you know, exceptionally warm. So it was uh, already signaling the previous evening when I uh, saw that uh, previous evening, it was very clear that something was going on, you know, for the Saudi prince to land there. The visit was not announced. Huh? Suddenly he just landed there. 
So, uh, there is a China-Russia part there. And uh, before this, the Iranian pri uh, president visited, uh, went on a state visit to China. China. And it was uh, Chinese really laid out a red carpet there. And uh, in the welcome words of the Chinese commentary, the Chinese Communist Party Central Committee's paper, Global Times, the commentary they said that, you know, that from a, a position of uh, autonomy uh, in uh, the Iranian foreign policy is shifting towards linking up with Russia and China. First time that this kind of a reference came and China is always very careful not to talk in terms of blocks, you know, but here they bracketed the three countries together, you know. So you see, when the Saudi foreign ministers, which I began mentioning, you know, the Saudi foreign ministers interview to the establishment daily, he said that uh, our three countries, that is Saudi Arabia, Iran and uh, China, are going to work on regional and international issues together. All right. So, which means, you know, that uh, there is a certain matrix in existence and uh, many things have to be worked out, you know, the, uh, the details naturally. Uh, but uh, one evidence of it is the Shamkani who was there in Beijing for this uh, announcement. Shamkani was day before yesterday, suddenly appeared in Abu Dhabi. And the relations between uh, the UAE and uh, um, Saudi, uh, UAE and Iran, okay, in a particularly difficult moment today. But this should not be a contradiction. For so the Iranian uh, interlocutor came to uh, UAE to talk to the leadership to iron out the problems there. David Ignatius in the Washington Post wrote day before yesterday that UAE is also, he used the word courting, courting China. Okay. So you see, the, there is a, let there be no doubt about it that uh, to answer your question, uh, these things are going to be felt all around. These things are going to be felt, you know, that the, 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 the processes which have begun will gather momentum and uh, trust the Chinese, Chinese commentaries all have mentioned this, that uh, there is going to be positive impact on a number of conflict situations in the region. You know, this one. So, uh, like Prabhu said, definitely um, Yemen matters for, uh, see already the American papers, today's papers and yesterday's paper were spreading the canard, you know, that uh, <coughs> Houthis will not listen to Iran. But haven't the Houthis already welcomed the announcement? That's what I'm trying to say. Now, you see, the point is they are terrified and now, you know, they are completely run out of ideas. And now, you know, that they are now uh, pumping up the Houthis and putting out a feeler to the Houthis that how would a, a, a deal? They want Houthis to be spoilers, mm -hmm. basically. Mm -hmm. But uh, <laughs> I've known the Iranians. Iranians are, you know, not uh, so very easy to handle. They have taken precautions, definitely. And for the Saudis, you know, it is a bleeding wound. And uh, this, uh, they cannot carry on this war. And also with the kind of estrangement that has taken place with the United States, there isn't any kind of support any longer, like in Trump's time, from the US, the military part of it. And uh, you may know that uh, UAE has already pulled out right. from, uh, from the war, you know. So it is now, you know, Saudi Arabia is holding this can of worms. And it's the only guys who can help all the Iranians in this. So it is definitely going to have a better effect then. It is the same way the Saudis are also reciprocating. Uh, this earthquake took place in uh, Syria. Turkey and Syria, yes. In Syria. I'm talking about the Syria part. Uh, Americans announced that, you know, that the sanctions are not going to be waived. They were then forced to tweak the sanctions. But initial reaction was, you know, they were riding the high horse, that there is no question of this one. Saudis announced an air bridge between Saudi Arabia and Syria to send relief supplies. And dozens of aircraft 
landing in Syria with relief supplies. And then the Saudi foreign minister gave an interview again where he has said that uh, Syria's problem is also our problem, reconstruction and all this kind of thing. So you see the uh, Syrian situation is also going to feel the difference now. Because in Syria already, the Russians are working on, see I mentioned to you earlier that you know there were many uh, signals in the last two to three years. Yes. These are actually these processes you know are very, Pragya it is like this that you know several tracks are running. Uh, there is a track between uh, Turkey and Russia. Right. Track between Turkey, Russia and uh, Syria. There is a track between Turkey and Egypt normalization. You know, now uh, Turkish foreign minister now for the first time in a long while landed in Cairo day before yesterday. Okay. So you see that is another track there. And uh, then this Saudi thing, uh, the UAE has recognized Syria. Uh, I mean, uh, has reopened the mission in uh, Damascus and um, high level visits already taken place. And Assad was also in the UAE, you know. So this, uh, that is already uh, underway. Saudis are now about to do that. So you see, in none of these things actually, if you see from the geopolitical perspectives, there is any American content. Right, Prabhupada. Right. That's a very important point that you're yeah, making, yeah, yeah. that this whole region is coming together slowly. Yes. Because it also realizes the futility of the war particularly war which seems to be the interest of the United States, yes. the Western powers. Yes. yes. And, you know, even the Islamic fundamentalists or ISIS, Daesh kind of forces, which, as we know, the United States is a big hand in helping them to destabilize Syria, to weaken Iraq. All of these have now shown that there is no mileage to any of this. So yes. countries like Saudis or the United Arab Emirates, Qatar, who had supported all of this. Mm -hmm. In fact, when the uh, Syrian uprising, as they called it, took place, mm -hmm. all of these countries were behind mm -hmm. in that. Now they're all slowly pulling out, normalizing, yeah. and you're quite right to say that this has already happened partially with Syria. Hmm. So similar forces are at work with Yemen as well, as mm -hmm. well is something that we can conjecture. Mm -hmm. Of course, we'd know about it sooner. Syria is more visible and you're quite right, right in calling, visible, yeah. calling attention to that. And it's also interesting, the United States talks about the international order and so on. The rules-based order. Rule-based international order. Well, the United States is in Syria. Its army is there. It's occupying places in Syria at nobody's invitation. No. One third of Syria. One, yeah. It's the a, arable huge. land of Syria. Yeah. The part of Syria where there is water. Tigris the Euphrates part of Syria Valley. where there are the oil fields. Tigris Euphrates Valley, really. Uh, this <laughs> really day, yeah. Syrians claim $110 billion worth of uh, oil has been stolen by the Americans yeah. and in military convoys taken out of Syria. So See, this is, uh, when, you, when the Americans speak about Ukraine, what you need to look at is one third of Syrian territory is under American occupation. Right, Prabir. I mean, that's what I wanted to ask you, that one of the things we learn is that the Ukraine conflict is not the only conflict that's going on in the world. That's not the only disturbance. But you mentioned business ties. Now, for China, is there a greater need for stability in this region, in West Asia, compared to what was there three years ago before the American Western intervention on behalf of Ukraine? You know, you've opened out in this question a much bigger set of issues. And I don't think we're going to be able to do justice to that. But is it that a weakening hegemon needs war much more? in order Basically. to keep the world fighting each other so they can at least sell them arms, okay, and play in within the differences. And countries which are developing economically, more forward moving and so on, want peace. Therefore, a developing country like China, even a country like India, or Russia, which was de partially de-industrialized post the 90s, that can it, in fact, their need for peace and the U.S. need for power is for war is much more. Considering also 
that US has a military budget which is 10 is, is equal to the next 10 or 11 countries military budget. The amount they have sent as military aid to Ukraine is actually more than Russia's military budget. So is it that the United okay. States has a more stake in war and its Western allies is a bigger stake on war because they are not in the productive part of the economy anymore. So war is not productive. You produce weapons, but at the end of it, you produce death and destruction. And you replenish your armory, new weapons, only because you destroyed part of human civilization and of course your weapons. So this, this kind of scenario, are we looking for when he talked about the, you know, a new international, quote unquote, a new international order emerging, which is multipolar. I think the one part of that is also that would require peace much more than it requires war. But does a weakening hegemon, world hegemon, does it require war more than peace? So that it can fiddle around, you know, set houses on fire to say, okay, we are pouring water on it. Is that the way the world is going? I think that's a question. It's sort of uh, your... Your question is really what opens that train of thought. As I said, we can't really do justice to it. I, to it. I think we'll have uh, Ambassador Bhadra Kumar with us again to mm -hmm. discuss the larger issue. Today, we have to restrict it to West Asia, uh, Middle East, whatever we want to call it. I only want to draw your attention that in all this, Iran is a player not only in West Asia, but also in Central Asia. So is Turkey. So is Russia. So is China. They are all players in Central Asia. And you know, Western Europe has occupied too big of the world's imagination. If you have a map and look at the globe, you'll see it's a very small part of the world. Right. So areas like, in, in fact, Central Asia is going to open up as a new, new place where tensions will take place, maybe some clashes will take place, war will take place, Armenia, Azerbaijan already has certain clashes. So what is the role that the countries like Russia, Iran, Turkey, and China will play is very important. And I don't see any possibility now, which was not there earlier, of the United States playing, United States playing a very important role in this area anymore. They can at best be spoilers. And I think that's what the world is slowly beginning to realize that the US, when it intervenes, it leads to longer term instabilities and local wars in which that they can meddle. But the Chinese move in all of this is, can I bring you into a larger trading uh, arrangement, brick, the Belt Road Initiative, and so on. And I think increasingly the question is productive use of assets against destructive use of weapons. Right. And I think that is the question that the world has to confront when it talks about the hegemony, whose hegemony. Well, actually, if you have a collaborative economy in the region, it benefits everybody. Right. That's what China has repeatedly emphasized in the statement as well. And that's something which the BRICS have said, for instance, Shanghai Cooperation has said. But it was really the BRICS bringing together different continents that, that really started a larger process. And none of this is, is, is an alliance against others. It's an alliance for, so to say. Ambassador Bhattukumar, do you have any closing remarks? Yeah, you know, one uh, point we didn't uh, dwell upon is this, that, you know, that uh, uh, there is a fundamental difference also between the Saudi thinking and the Iranian thinking. Iran's foreign policy ideology is the ideology which is riveted on justice and resistance. You know, that one. Now, uh, that is a, leg uh, a legacy of the revolution. From the alchemy of the revolution, this ideology took shape. It's a resistance to any bullying, repression, it's directly anti-American. Saudis have not done that. Saudis cannot do that also because, you know, from the horrible example they have made of Russia, the Americans, uh, Saudis can go bankrupt. They are elite, you know, their assets are lying in America and uh, they need a petrodollar for some more time, you know, for and with their, especially with their ambitious program and so on. So you see, I read the Saudi approach to this is, therefore, is one of uh, 
keeping your relationship with the U.S., but creating space to negotiate more effectively with the U.S. They are not dumping the relationship, in other words. As far as the Iranians are concerned, they are in a supremely happy position of not having a relationship with the U.S. anyway. And the Iranians are therefore going the whole hog and uh, look at it, you know, that they have uh, offered to share their expertise in busting American sanctions to the Russians. And the Russians are taking it, and uh, the American papers are full of it, right. that Russians are picking up very dangerous ideas from his Iran, you know. And when they get together now, and now, you know, for instance, you know, they have taken out their transactions out of the dollar zone. They are dealing in local currencies. So the, uh, with, with the SWIFT, for instance, it's one of the stupid things that the Americans made. Right. Because now the Russians, are, SWIFT means what? All transactions done by Russia were under monitoring. The Americans always knew that with what they traded and what why there's such a big volume of trade it suddenly appeared through SWIFT, etc. But now they have no clue what's happening between these countries. So, you know, they are now doing, you know, all kinds of transactions. And the same thing is happening also with China. And out of that only came this rumor, are arms sales happening with China? Right. Du dual uh, purpose technology. So, you know, the, <clears throat> the thing is, uh, uh, this, we should be careful not to look at it as a ganging up. Now, again, if, for instance, you know, Saudi Arabia is only one country, but the biggest exporter of natural gas from that region, and second only to Russia, is Qatar. And now Qatar has got excellent relations with the Western world and Qatar cannot do without the Western world because their markets all lie there, you know, in, in, in Europe and uh, all that, LNG. They are in the LNG, they don't have pipe gas, LNG. So you see, we have to be mindful of this also, that uh, this is not an anti-American thing, except of course Iran, it is an anti-American thing and Iran will go the whole hog now to exploit this situation and to create for themselves, you know, enough space to throw off the American bullying, you know. But uh, the Saudis and others will tread softly, carefully. Then Saudi Arabia, there is also the added problem that uh, they are uh, going to have a very tricky succession. Right. And the Americans have made it very clear that they don't like this prince. And now the prince has consolidated himself and he is determined to succeed as the next monarch and he is so young that he, is, he may be for half a century the king of Saudi Arabia. So you see, so that, that is also something that the uh, Saudis are waiting for. And then most important thing is from the Saudi point of view, the last word is to be said only after the 2024 election results come out in the US. Who knows, also right. true. Who knows what will happen? Right. Because the American political elites are all in the Saudi pocket. <laughs> You know, so you see, if uh, for some reason, you know, it's too early to say, why is Biden dithering about announcement? Because in the, even within the Democratic Party, there is a certain kind of uh, uh, thinking that he may not be, it may not be a bright idea to feel this old man as their candidate. They must have, they must look to the future and have a better candidate. So anything can happen. The Saudis are always, uh, therefore, acting with an eye on the 2024 election. Again, when it comes to Iran, it has no inhibitions of this kind. The only right. thing I'd like to add is one sentence. <clears throat> is if you remember what Kissinger said, that it is dangerous to be an enemy of the United States. The only thing more dangerous is to be its friend. <laughs> <laughs> so Saudi was a friend of the United States. Mm. And I think that is what is now making them much more shaky. So anyway, on a lighter vein, Kissinger, I think, did make it on a lighter vein. Hopefully, in <laughs> Right, Prabir. Uh, thank you, Pastor Bhatta Kumar, for joining us. Pleasure. Thank you. And that's all we have for you today. Thank you very much for watching Mapping Fault Lines. And you can wait for our next episode and follow us on our social media channels. Thanks a lot for watching.